Um, but good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is James Long. I'm the president of IT at Georgia Tech, Institute of Technology and Engineering at Georgia Tech. Um, and we are the student, uh, really one of the large, larger student groups of our department of Technology Engineering Department here at Tech. Um, and we're made up of engineers, planners, um, and anyone who has an interest. We even have an undergraduate this year. <laughs> uh, we are largely graduate students in transportation. Um, so far this year, we've already had a lot of great events, um, a lot of professional lunches where we have, uh, whether it's professionals of, of all different types come in, we've had a lot of consultants this year, so we're certainly looking if there are public sector folks who want to, who are interested in having a conversation with graduate students, you know, we're always welcome to having people come and join us. Um, but we've also had uh, some social events, uh, whether it be uh, going to a pumpkin patch or going ice skating later this year that's coming up. Um, we've got a lot of other interesting things going on with this event, which we're really excited about this year. Um, and, and that's a lot about what's going on in IT. Um, I want to thank uh, the University Transportation Center and the Georgia Transportation Institute for all of their support. They sponsored us tonight. Um, we're more than happy to do the legwork, but they uh, really came through in helping us uh, bring uh, Dr. Chenk out here tonight and to provide the fuel for tonight. So I do thank them very much. Um, as well as Georgia Tech for giving us a pretty neat space, which I haven't been in before. Um, I just want to also thank, there's a lot of, we have a lot of professionals here tonight, which is great. We are a student group and we usually see a lot of one another at all these events. Tonight I think it's a great opportunity to see a lot of the professionals. We have folks representing GDOT, ARC, MARTA, CQGRD, Evermore, CID, Arcadis, Foresight, Gresham Smith, Fulton County. There's a pretty long list of people um, in the professional sector who are here tonight, including all of uh, our, our professors here at Georgia Tech. So we're really excited to have everyone's participation. I hope you got to meet some of the students and students took advantage to network outside uh, before the event. Um, we also have a lot of support from ITE Georgia, Georgia Section ITE, and actually a president back there, John, is uh, with us tonight. So we just want to say thank you for their ongoing support as well. Um, and then the two professors who did help put this night to put this together, Dr. Kerry Watkins and uh, Dr. Michael Hunter. So thank you very much to both of you. So with that, I just want to say thanks again for everyone for coming out. And I'm going to introduce uh, Greg McFarlane, who's going to be uh, introducing Josh. I'm Greg McFarland, a PhD student in the engineering program and a master's student in the economics program. Uh, we're very grateful to have Joshua Shank here. Dr. Dr. Shank is the president and the CEO of the Eno Center for Transportation, which is a leading Washington, D.C. based uh, transportation policy think tank. Uh, they work with uh, transportation policymakers both in politics and in, uh, down the hill and in, uh, in industry to, to promote transportation policy and leadership. Uh, Dr. Shank has a PhD in urban planning from Columbia and master's degrees, a master's degree in urban planning from MIT as well. Uh, I met Dr. Shank when I participated in the uh, Eno Center for Transportation's annual leadership, uh, graduate leadership development conference. Uh, Josie Kressner and I, Chris Silver, I don't know if she's here tonight or not, but we all participated in Georgia Tech last year. Uh, that's a wonderful program. Um, I encourage you to learn about it and apply for it. Dr. Shank uh, was the transportation policy advisor to Senator Clinton during the development of the Safety Lou, which is the last service transportation authorization bill, and played a major role in monitoring the, the progress of MAP 21, which is our new transportation legislation. Um, prior to his work with uh, Senator Clinton, he worked in the U.S. Department of Transportation and with the Metropolitan Transportation Authority of New York. He lives in Washington, D.C. with his wife and two sons. Welcome to your time. Thanks, Greg. Let's see if it might make things better or worse. Well, thank you for having me today. Um, is that too echoey or is that OK? Good? All right. So let's um, start with a couple of uh, definitions, because I think just so we're all on the same page about a few things. Uh, MAP 21, as Greg said, is moving ahead for progress in the 21st century. That's the new transportation bill that we're all operating under. It governs 
surface transportation legislation, which really means just highways and public transit. Uh, rail is separate, aviation is separate. And the reason it's called Map 21 is because Barbara Boxer is the chair of the Environment and Public Works Committee, and she said her number one priority going into reauthorization was that this bill is going to be called Map 21. And that's what it is. And this bill is a two-year bill that governs uh, the, next, uh, the next two years of transportation policy, meaning giving out money to states. Um, and the title of the presentation is Map 21 Incremental Bipartisanship, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love General Fund Revenues. And that's because those are two both optimistic ways of looking at this legislation. Uh, one is to say, look, this is the best we could do. It's incremental. It moved the ball forward. It was bipartisan. Let's, let's be happy with that. But the more optimistic way of looking at it is to say, even go even further and ignore all the crises surrounding the federal government and service transportation would say, actually, this is not necessarily a bad thing that we're relying more on general fund revenue. So just so we're all clear on what that means, uh, and we'll get into this in more detail, but general fund revenues means that in, historically, service transportation was funded entirely by your 18.4 cent federal gas tax. That is no longer the case. In fact, we have about $20 billion that was just put in from general fund revenues, meaning taxes collected from other sources, that was put in to the fund that funds all the service transportation. And that has been a trend that's been going on since 2008. And in the transportation community, this is typically regarded as a terrible, horrible thing that's going to ruin our lives because we are relying on these general funds and the government's going to cut our funding and uh, we don't have our dedicated revenue source, and God, if we could just increase the gas tax, our life would be so much easier. And I'm going to tell you why I think we can look at it in a different way as well. So here's how we're going to proceed. Um, first, I'm going to talk about what happened leading up to Map 21 and the reauthorization process, and how we were thinking about reform and policy reform for surface transportation at that time. And then, just because four is a nice number, I'm going to give you four things that I like, four things I don't like, and uh, you know, it's it's very it's it's so easy to get up and punch Congress in the face over and over again, and I'm going to try not to do that. Um, and instead, I'm going to talk about the positives, and then that's why I've got four of each, even though it may not actually be that even. And then finally, what can be done about it? Uh, what can we what can we do to improve upon the four things that are not so great? So let's talk about the need for reform. And I apologize in advance for the fact that I like to um, use examples of my children and my talk. But I, I you know, think Congress sometimes acts like a two-year-old, and I have a two-year-old, so it's perfect. Uh, my two-year-old, uh, what he does is he comes into the room every morning. And we have a clock in our bedroom. And the clock is a digital clock. And, for some reason, we have a digital clock where there are very big buttons, and those buttons change the time very easily. <laughs> so Jonah, as you can imagine, being a two-year-old boy, comes in and pushes the different buttons and changes the time, and as a result, we have no idea what time it is when we're in the bed. Now, there are many approaches we could take to solving this problem. <laughs> we could, for example, buy a new clock. That would be you know, $10 and probably solve the problem. We could move the clock so somewhere that he could reach. I mean, the kid's this high. But we don't do either of those things, and instead we just continue to reset the clock all the time, <laughs> consistently. Now, that's exactly what Congress does with service transportation. There's no difference. The, what, what the, the continuing crisis is in service transportation is that no one wants to change how things are done. No one wants to make the decision and say, well, let's get more money and let's do this right, or alternatively, let's only spend the money we have. Instead, it's a constant crisis of we're running out of money and everyone's going to die and bridges are going to fall down, so what do we do? And then eventually Congress throws something together and we fix the problem. That's pretty much what Map 21 uh, is. Now, there, were, there was this bill that, that Greg referred to before called Safety Lou, which is another great name, Safety Lou, of course, Lou being the wife of the guy who uh, wrote the bill. Uh, so, Lou, Safety Lou was a bill that was widely seen as very problematic from a transportation policy perspective. It was known primarily for pork. It was known as a big bill that Congress brought home money in all their districts. And you can read all about it in my book called All Roads Lead to Congress, and I recommend you do that. But the point is that it was not a, uh, a, a bill that was very heavy on policy. When I got to work for Senator Clinton, my job was not 
to work on the best possible transportation policy. My job was to bring home as much money to New York State as I possibly could. And I tried to do that, um, but that's only because it was my job. I didn't come in there caring, particularly about how much money New York State got versus anybody else. But that was what I had to do. So let's look at how the previous system was set up and some of the problems that we were trying to tackle when we were thinking about reform. There were three basic problems. One is something called donor donee. And if you haven't heard of donor donee, consider yourself lucky because you don't live in DC, you don't work on transportation policy, and so you haven't heard of this insanity, which is that some states put more money into the highway trust fund, which funds all surface transportation, than they get back. So some states, there's a lot more, for example, there's a lot more driving going on in Texas uh, per capita than there is in New York. And so Texas puts in a lot more money than they get back. They, they actually get back about 92% of the, of the money that they put into the highway trust fund. Whereas New York has a lot of public transportation and has fewer people driving per capita and they require a lot more subsidy and so New York gets a lot more back. Now that's part of the story. The other part of the story is that the guy who wrote the initial transportation bill in 1991 was a senator from New York named Patrick Moynihan who made sure that New York had more money back than they put in, but that's a different question. The point is that there are some states that win and some states that lose and that was the primary focus of the policy discussion is who's going to win and who's going to lose. Let's fight each other over that. And when I came in there, they were fighting to see how much money can we take from New York and still get this bill passed. That was, that, that was what their job was. The Republicans were in charge. They didn't really, really, really care very much whether Senator Clinton was successful in her re-election effort. So they were pretty much happy to try to take as much money as possible from New York. So that's donor donee. Obviously a distraction from good policy discussion. Number two, modal silos. Everything is set up strictly wrong mode. Public transit gets about 20%, highways gets about 80%, and there's no multimodal planning, there's no multimodal thinking, everything is very focused on individual modes, and as a result, we are very focused on projects, and I want this project for me, and I want this project for you, and everyone wants their project, and no one's thinking about planning a transportation system, or how we fund people who might want to plan a transportation system. Very much focused on modes. And then third, which I already alluded to, inadequate resources. We've been talking about the gas tax problem for 10 years. The gas tax has been at 18.4 cents since 1993, but the crisis of funding did not actually occur until more recently because until 2007, vehicle miles traveled were increasing nationally, so you had increasing revenues coming into the highway trust fund. But a couple things happened. One, BMT leveled off, and two, cars became more fuel efficient. And three, the cost of construction went up. So as a result, in real terms, the gas tax has declined pretty substantially. So we don't have enough money. To, and we haven't had enough money for a long time. So this is how Safety Lou broke out. And I think the, the key point here, there, there are actually over 100 programs in Safety Lou, so this is consolidating them quite substantially. But the key point here is that the biggest highway program in Safety Lou is something called Equity Bonus. Equity bonus was basically what we fought over for the entire three years that we were trying to reauthorize this bill. And what equity bonus does is it says every state gets a minimum of 92.5% return on their gas tax contributions. So it was all about donor donee. It was the central force of the bill. And what it does is it created a separate program to give money to states solely for the purposes of balancing out how much every state gets. So if you think about that, if you're a state, and you are getting a huge pot of money that has pretty much zero restrictions on it and is only do, it's only just supposed to balance out how much money you have, what's your incentive to use that money towards any kind of national purpose or goals or anything related to what you might want to accomplish with the federal transportation program? It's not that high. And, and a lot of people focused on the problem of Safety Lou being the, the poor. And there were an unprecedented, unprecedented number of earmarks in safety, over 6,000. Compared to 1987, when we had 152 earmarks in the transportation bill, and President Reagan vetoed it for having too many earmarks. So things changed quite dramatically uh, in that time period. And what I like to say about earmarks is they were a symptom of the problem. They were not the problem. Earmarks were symptomatic. They were clearly indicating that there was a lack of purpose to this program. Because if everyone's fighting about equity bonus and how much does my state get, and everyone's trying to get as many earmarks as possible, that means no one really knows why we're doing this program. 
No one has a clear idea of what we're trying to accomplish because if they did, there wouldn't be a hundred plus different programs embedded. There wouldn't be this fight over donor donor, and there wouldn't be this fight over, over earmarks and, and this multiplication of earmarks. So the bill became about pork, and that's exactly what it was known for. If you ask the average American about the surface transportation bill, they'd probably give you a blank stare, but then you can remind them and say, remember the bridge to nowhere? They said, oh yeah, the bridge to nowhere. That's what the surface transportation bill is often known for. There's a front cover page on the parade magazine, which the average American supposedly reads. And there was lots of conversation about this bridge to nowhere, which is, for those who don't know, is a bridge in Alaska that's serving a population of about 50 people and costs several hundred million dollars. And there was concern that this was emblematic of the, of the problem in Washington of too much pork. And it may well have been, but even more so, it was emblematic of a complete lack of focus in the surface transportation system and the surface transportation policy of the federal government. Now, why is that? Well, it's a policy that was created to build the interstate system. The policy of collecting this gas tax and distributing it to states was created because we had a system we wanted to build. The way the interstate system was built was that the federal government said, here's where you want to, we're going to build it, and we're going to give you the money, we're going to give you 90% of the funding for it, and you're going to own it and operate it. The states are going to own it and operate it, but we're going to give you 90% of the funding on a cost-to-complete basis for the system. Well, that made a lot of sense for a high building an interstate highway system. It does not happen to make very much sense for a mature surface transportation network like we have today. And so no one has really changed that basic structure. And so when, when the interstate system was created and people in Montana were, were getting subsidized by people in New Jersey, because people in New Jersey had to pay more so we could build a road through Montana that a lot fewer people were driving on, New Jersey was OK with that because it was a clear purpose. You said, I, I get it. I'm building an interstate system. We all have to pitch in. But when there's no clear purpose, then you get fights over how much money is a nice state get and what are my earmarks. And that becomes the primary goal of policy. So when we went into this, we had three reform goals for coming out of Safety Loop. You know, I'm someone who worked on Safety Loop, and I immediately started to try to fix the problem of what I created. And I was not the only one. There were two commissions set up by Safety Loop to look at the problem of how we fix the surface transportation policy. And there were three primary goals of the reform process, of which I was a part of, which many people were a part of. One, create a performance-based service transportation system that was based on national goals. So articulate what the national goals are for the system, and then evaluate our performance on how we're doing in achieving those. Number two, make it more multimodal and make programmatic investment decisions. So let's not worry so much about how much each boat gets, because that was another fight we were engaged in. And in New York, we were constantly fighting about the people who want to take transit's money and put it into highways. So get rid of these modal battles and make it a multi-mode neutral system, a multimodal system. And then finally, moving from a top-down process, which worked well for the interstate, saying here's what you should build, and this is the money for X, to a bottom-up process, where we say to states, look, here's the money. You do what you want with it. We just want to see how you're doing with respect to this performance. We don't care what mode you build. We don't care where you build it. We just want to see the outcomes with respect to performance and national goals. And that's how we went into this process. And we had a lot of optimism going in that we could make a lot of these changes. And there are four things to like about Map 21, in part because of this reform movement. And we will gladly take credit for it, along with other people. But the story of Map 21 is that Against all odds and expectations, a bill was passed. Most people did not expect that there would ever be a service transportation bill in this environment. We had an election year. We had a divided Congress with us fighting over everything. Everything had become hyperpartisan. And you had a chair of the Environment Public Works Committee, Barbara Boxer, who was known as one of the top environmentalists in the Senate, and a ranking member who she had to work with named James Inhofe, who was a climate change denier. And these two people had to work together to put the service transportation bill together. And somehow they did it. Somehow they managed to scrape together this legislation and hold it and make it happen and get overwhelming support for it. And it's an incredible story. I'm not going to focus that much on the political story of how that happened. Instead, I'm going to talk about the things that you used to like about it. And again, I have another story about, about my son. This is my older son, Max, who is five. Max is five. He's been traveling a lot in his short life because we have parents and in-laws all around the country. So Max is very versed at going through metal detectors. And Max, when he goes through uh, the first you know, four years of his life, he'd go get to the security line, take off the shoes, put them in the bucket, and go through security. And then one day, they came and they changed the rule. And so now, if you're under 12, you don't have to take off your shoes. 
Now, I tell that story because, you know, Max Force County, you know, I was like very confused. Why don't I take my shoes? But I tell that story because that is such an obvious thing to do, right? <laughs> that you shouldn't have four year olds take off their shoes because, they, you know, you want to make sure they don't have shoe bombs. Probably not a necessary security measure, but it took TSA 10 years to get to that, right? So, expectations were slightly diminished for what, for what TSA could be accomplished if we're seeing that as a huge boom, like a major leap forward in security that now four-year-olds don't have to take off their shoes. And this, similarly, it's true in MAP21. So these are all good things, but they are much less than what we had hoped to achieve when we first started out in the reform process. So one of the big things to like is program consolidation. I mentioned earlier that there were over 100 programs in the Federal Service Transportation Bill. Some people would say, well, there are over 100 constituencies that people were catering to in Congress, so that's how you get over 100 programs. And obviously, if you have over 100 programs, you don't have a very clear focus. Uh, we had programs for everything. You know, there's a, a program for every region of the country. There's a program for every idea anyone ever had for what the transportation solution is, a maglev program or a diesel retrofit program or anything you can think of. So we proposed in our reform package that we could consolidate down to six programs. And we got to 30. <laughs> I mean, that's better than staying at 100, right? The major consolidation was these three big programs. They took the National Highway System program. And the National Highway System is the interstate system plus a whole bunch of other roads that states have said, these are really important to the national government, so you should fund them. And the National Highway System, the interstate system, and bridges all have three separate funding streams. They're huge, big formula programs. They've now consolidated those all into the National Highway Performance Program. That's just an example of some of the consolidation. But it makes a big difference. When you consolidate, you're saying, here's what the purpose of this money is, as opposed to, we have 100 purposes for this money. So it's a good step forward. Number two, performance measures. This is a big focus of what we're trying to do. So of course, being Congress, they couldn't just put some performance measures in. <laughs> they had to put them in in random places and, and for weird reasons. But they put them in there, and that is tremendous. When T21, which is the bill that, that preceded Safety Lou, when that was being reauthorized, when we were talking about getting Safety Lou together, everyone came in and said, T21 works great, don't change a thing, we love it, wonderful. That was not happening under Safety Lou. Under Safety Lou, everyone was coming in and saying, you have to put performance in, you have to have a performance-based program, enough of this nonsense. And so the fact that this change is important and it's significant. Um, one of the great things about having no money is that there was not much money to fight about. So people were able to talk about things like policy, and you got <laughs> performance measures. Now, these are, there, are five, there are five different ways that performance measures show up. One is the national goals, which are at the top. They did articulate national goals. Those are essentially meaningless. We'll get to why that is. <laughs> but then there are the four programs that have uh, performance measures embedded. One is the planning process. So now the planning process has performance measures associated with it. The safety program, which already was the most performance-based program, now even more specific. Higher performance program has specific performance measures associated with it. And CMAP. So it's great. I mean, they, they, they started the process. We'll get to the limitations of it. But the fact that they're there is a huge step forward. The pork's gone, so that's good. The pork was there um, in huge quantities, and it's nice to see that it's out. Now, there are downsides to the fact that there are no more earmarks. For example, it is harder to pass a bill without earmarks. That's why a lot of people are surprised that we got a bill done. Earmarks are usually the way you grease the wheels and get the thing through. So it's a miracle that it happened without earmarks. And secondly, there are earmarks are not all bad. Earmarks sometimes fund good projects, right? And sometimes earmarks fund, fund good projects, and they have no other mechanism by which they can get funding besides an earmark. For example, I'm not commenting on whether this is a good project or not, but there ha I happened to talk to somebody in Portland, Oregon, who they were putting in this new light rail line. And they said, look, we tried to get money for this through the usual process. We couldn't get any money for it, so we got it through an earmark. And the point is that some of those are good, and those are now gone, and that means a different, you have, it may not be that all uh, projects we want to see done are getting done. But it's a great step forward that earmarks were not part of the process. It had nothing to do with our reform efforts. I mean, it had everything to do with the fact that the Republican Congress was elected on a platform of, we're not going to have any more earmarks, and they thankfully held to that. But I think it was an overall net positive for transportation policy. TIFIA expansion. So for those who don't know what TIFIA is, TIFIA is a method of financing 
that the federal government provides. They provide discounted loans and loan guarantees for transportation projects. And the reason that TIFIA is important is that there are some projects that have a revenue source associated with them, like a toll road, or perhaps even a transit project if they have a dedicated tax stream. And they have that revenue source, and they can't get financing in the private market, or if they can, it's at a high rate. Federal government, Federal Highway Administration will give you a loan at a lower rate. So it's a great way to move projects along without spending very much money from the federal government's perspective. It was oversubscribed last time, it was $122 million under safety rule. It was oversubscribed, so they boosted it to $750 million in the first year and a billion in the next year in Act 21. Now, you know, there's more money, it can fund a greater percentage of the overall project, and it's more multimodal. They are now more accepting of transit projects. So why did this happen? Well, this happened because Barbara Boxer um, is uh, from California, and she has uh, a mayor in California, uh, Mayor Antonio Villagrosa, who came to Washington pretty much every month telling her how important it was to get a TIFIA project, because she, he wants to use TIFIA to expand the transit system in Los Angeles as part of his plan, because he's got this dedicated half-cent sales tax for transit. I know that that's a sore subject here. I'm not trying to <laughs> bring that up. But he, uh, they got that done, and so they had this money, but they wanted to do it faster, and so they wanted to use TIFIA to borrow more. And so that's how things get done in Washington. The chair of the committee is from California. Somebody in California wants something, it gets done. But it's also got done because Republicans like this. Republicans like this because it's an efficient way of using public resources. You're loaning out money, and you're getting a good return back on your investment. So now we get to my favorite part, which is, of course, things you don't like. Now, I am. I start off with this anecdote from Columbia, where I was also an undergraduate. Because I lived in a dorm my senior year at Columbia. And in this dorm, uh, was newly renovated. We were the first people to get to move into this new dorm, which was a great dorm. And I, was, I had a fantastic lottery number. I got to choose one of the first rooms on campus I got to choose. And I looked at the, the layout of the dorm, and the 10th floor had the biggest rooms. And I picked this room on the 10th floor. It was huge. And we get to the 10th floor, and the 10th floor was smaller than all the other floors. Um, the big rooms were bigger, but the, the area was smaller. And it was, you, could, you had to get there by taking an elevator to the ninth floor and then walking up the stairs. And we get there, and we see there's one bathroom for the floor, uh, one for men, one for women. And that bathroom was handicapped accessible. So what to make of that? Take a second. I think the point of that story is that people have, may have good intentions, but they don't necessarily accomplish the desired goal. Because obviously there's no person in a wheelchair who was going to be using that bathroom. And everybody who was using that bathroom was somebody who was not disabled. And it was kind of a, a great example of regulations gone awry, and people thinking, oh, I'm doing this good thing, I'm going to help people, and then winding up with spending something that, that not only didn't help people, but actually made my life somewhat annoying, because if you ever use a handicapped photo for the entire year, you know why that would be. <laughs> so here are four things that don't like. One, um, lack of discretionary grant programs. So here I have to explain that most of the money that's given out is given out by formula. So when I talk about this fighting about who's getting how much money, that's all about formulas. There's a formula Congress writes that says, this is how much each state gets. And there are also programs that are discretionary grant programs. You may have heard of the New Starts program, for example. That's a discretionary grant program that gives out capital funds for public transit investments in rail. So Congress does not like discretionary grant programs. The president loves discretionary grant programs. Why is that? Because discretionary means at the discretion of the executive branch. So Congress wants to have discretion. That's why they like earmarks. They do not like giving the discretion to the executive branch. Policy people, however, like discretionary grant programs, not because we love this president or any president or any executive administration, but because when you have earmarks, Congress is just bringing home money, giving money to projects without much real thought to it. When you have a discretionary grant program, there's a competition, there's professionals doing analysis, looking at what's the best project, how much should we fund, what's the return on investment. Those are the things we like. So the fact that there are fewer discretionary grant programs means more money is going out blindly without regard to any kind of performance measures or national goals or return on investment. 
And if you look at what they did, basically what they did is they took that 7% of your marks that were in the last bill, and they put it all into the formula money. So Congress is saying, look, we're getting rid of earmarks, but we're sure as hell not going to give it to the executive branch. We're going to keep it for ourselves and just increase the amount of formula money going out. And so in effect, the discretionary grant programs, which we would all hope would grow, uh, stayed the same, and more money proportionally is going out uh, through formula programs. Um, there's, there's lots of uh, concern that this is something that's going to be very difficult to fix because there's growing hostility, not only between the parties, but between Congress and the executive. Some of you may be familiar with the high-speed rail program, uh, with the Tiger program. Those are programs that came out of the stimulus package. And the Congress consistently refers to those as executive earmarking programs. They think, oh, the executive branch, they're so political. They just give that money to the people that they want to pay off. And you know, this is Congress uh, saying that. So, <laughs> It's a, it's a very, it doesn't matter what administration's in power. The Bush administration made an exec, had a discretionary grant program. The Democrats in Congress hated it. It doesn't matter. They always will fight over that. So the national goals and performance measures that I alluded to earlier, that they are weak. Well, here's why they're weak. The national goals are not tied to anything at all. Um, they're really not much different from a preamble to the bill saying, here's what we want to do. I mean, it doesn't matter. They're just listed. It's better than not having them listed, but it's not, it doesn't really mean anything. So what MAP21 does is it articulates these national goals and it articulates the performance measures. But then states have to set the targets for what they want to do with respect to the performance measures. And then they report on that progress to USDOT. Well, how is that going to change anything? States are setting their own targets for, for what they want to accomplish. So they're obviously not going to want to set targets that are more than they can do. And secondly, there's no carrot, there's no stick. In order to have performance measures work, you have to have either a penalty for not meeting them or you have to have an incentive for meeting them. And neither of those things are included. Now, why is that? Well, guess who helped develop the performance measures? It was the Federal Highway Administration that developed these performance measures working with the American Association for State Highway Transportation Officials. For those of you who don't know, that is the lobbying shop that represents the state DOTs. So the state DOTs essentially helped write the legislation that would monitor how they spend the money that they're getting from the federal government. And that's why there's no power behind it. That's why these are rather meaningless. In order to have them be meaningful, the existing stakeholders can't write the legislation. That's kind of a key first a priori thing you got to do. And here, what happened here is we're moving closer to policy. We have some performance measures. At least they didn't say, oh, we're not getting any performance measures. We're state DOTs. We know what's best, which is what their attitude was before we started this conversation. But they're still not at the point where they're willing to be held accountable or where there's any accountability for how the federal government is using this money and whether it's getting any kind of return on investment. No progress on the formula factors. So embedded in these formulas, there are lots of different formulas in safety loop. There are all these formula factors embedded in those formulas. In the end, they just rejiggered all the formulas to make sure every state got the right amount. But they started somewhere. And what they started with were formulas that are based on BMT, lane miles, and fuel consumption. So in other words, the more fuel you consume, the more lane miles you have, the more vehicle miles traveled, the more money you get. That makes some sense if you're allocating based on need. Doesn't necessarily make, some, make sense if one of your goals, for example, is reducing petroleum consumption. Those formula factors were then they added in the equity bonus, and that's how they smoothed out and got how much money and made sure it was all even so they could all pass the bill and be happy. And that was the safety of the allocation. Well, the way they did it in MAP 21 is they said, we can't argue about these formulas if we're going to get this bill passed. Usually the formula fight is what takes up two years of Congress's time. They fight over how much money they're each going to get, and it takes forever. And they wisely recognized that if they were starting to open up the formulas for fights, they were never going to pass this bill. And so they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to keep the formulas exactly the same. There's no change, which is unusual. Because usually whoever's in power now wants to take more money. I mean, they weren't in power last time, but this time, no change. And keep it, which is amazing also because California is a uh, donor state. California gets back less than, than a dollar for every dollar it sends to DC because there's a lot of driving that goes on in California. So Barbara Boxer is basically saying, look, I'm, I'm not going to have this fight. That's fine. But what they did say was, well, that's, we're going to have a 95% return on our gas taxes. Now, what's the difference? 95% return used to be 
meaningful when the entire program is funded by gas taxes. Now, we just put in $20 billion of general fund revenues in order to be, keep the program at current funding levels. So when they say that we want 95% return, which is an increase over 92.5%, so we're going to have more of our money back, they're saying it's only on the gas taxes, not on the amount, total amount that's in there. And as a result, that 95% actually doesn't mean anything until the gas tax is increased or until Congress cuts, revenue, cuts spending to align with revenues, neither of which is likely to happen. So the 95% is largely symbolic. So in the end, there hasn't been much progress because we're still using those formula factors that were created back then. They're hidden. They're not there. You can't see them. There's no equity bonus. That's great. But in the end, at the end of the day, they're still the same formula factors. We're not distributing money based on any kind of reasonable analysis. We're not making a distinction between why one state should get this much and this state should get that much, or what the money is even going for. It's just purely political. The only difference is that they're going on the politics of the last bill instead of new politics. And the biggest one, of course, is that there's been no progress in the long-term funding issue. I criticized Asha before, but I have no problem stealing their chart. <coughs> and what their chart says, <coughs> excuse me, what their chart says is that they were going to run out of money <coughs> pretty much when this bill is over, if not before. And that the $20 billion infusion that they were able to wrangle is only sufficient to get us through the next two years. And then <coughs> the, both the highway account and the mass transit account of the highway trust fund are going to go into deficit. And they are not legally allowed to go into deficit. So that means that Congress is going to have to act before this bill is over to either put more general fund revenues into the highway trust fund, or raise the gas tax, don't count on it, or cut spending to align with revenues. Now, none of those options are particularly appealing for Congress. So what can be done about all this? When I was in grad school, every time anyone ever presented a paper, all my advisor ever said was, so what? And I think it's a good question. So what? So it's a mess. What are we going to do? Well, here, here are four things I think we can think about. And the first three are really doable. They are doable. You have to work. And it's not going to be easy to do them. But it's possible. The performance measures are now there. You just have to tie them to funding. They're not bad. They're not like, great, my favorites. And for example, there's performance measures in there for pavement condition. I don't think that matters. You know, what a, a road that five people drive on is not equal to a road that 500 people drive on. But in, if you use pavement condition as a metric, then it is. But you can quibble about the metrics. We can fight about what they should be. But more important is they have to be tied to funding. They have to have a plan to tie them to funding. And that means you have to say, look, we're going to compare states. The federal government is terrified of comparing states. The Federal Highway Administration would rather do anything than compare how well states are doing with their, with their money. Because if they, the state that's at the bottom of the list is going to call and scream at them. In fact, the 10 states at the bottom of the list are going to call and scream at them. And if there's anything bureaucrats want to avoid, it's getting an angry call from a government. So there's no incentive uh, to do that. But it's got to be done. Because if you don't tie funding to performance, you won't see any measurable change. Um, and it's not going to be done quickly. It's not going to be done tomorrow. But it's something to think about that we can move the ball forward on in the next two years as we look to reauthorizing the next bill. The formula factors, another thing that can change. There's just no excuse for the formula factors being based on the politics of 2005, much less politics at all. But fine, there's going to be political influence on the formulas. But why not have formulas that are developed based on something rational, like Here's where we would get the most return on our investment. Here's where we wouldn't. I understand that there are challenges embedded in that. I mean, if you go to, for example, uh, Congress and say, you know, 82% of Americans live in metropolitan areas. Perhaps we should consider funding more transportation in metropolitan areas. You'll have a whole ton of senators come to you and say, well, I'm not a metropolitan state. And I actually get two votes. Just in Montana gets two votes, and California gets two votes. So the rural states are going to win that battle. And I recognize that those are challenges. But you can uh, make changes to the formulas that, have, that, that are improvements. You don't have to go whole hog. You don't have to make it perfect. But something that pr provides funding on some basis of where the return on investment would be would be a huge step forward. 
Multimodal freight and metropolitan discretionary grant programs. Such a huge deal. With respect to freight, there was no freight program before MAP 21. Thankfully, MAP 21 at least recognized the need for a freight program. They didn't technically fund it <laughs> or do anything with any money, but they at least said the words freight and program in the same sentence, so that's a start. But freight, the reason that they don't want to do it is that it has to be multimodal, and they know it has to be multimodal. You can't just do a highway freight program. What is that? It has to be multimodal. Even the trucking companies will say it has to be multimodal, but the problem is that the <laughs> more of the vagaries of Congress. There are three different committees that authorize this bill. There's the Environment Public Works Committee, which does the highway portion. There's the Commerce Committee that does rail and safety portion. And then there's the Banking Committee, which does the transit portion. If you're wondering about that, it's because the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, Transit used to be in Urban Affairs. That's how things work in DC, is we have crazy things like that. But the point is that the Commerce Committee put a multimodal freight discretionary program together, and they wanted to do it, and they wanted to fund it. And the Highway Committee, which has all the power in this fight because they have most of the money, said no. So it's not impossible for it to happen. It's just going to need more support from the highway crowd. And that means more support from the truckers, more support from the DOTs. All the usual highway suspects have to be OK with getting multimodal freight in there. And then Metropolitan Discretionary Grant Programs. I mentioned New Starts earlier. It's great that we have a program that funds public transit investments, but why do we want to stop with public transit? I mean, just building public transit is not sufficient for metropolitan regions. They need lots more multimodal investments than that. And public transit in itself doesn't do anything. You have to have feeders. You have to have pedestrian ways of getting there. You have to have bike lanes. You have to have land use changes. All these things need to be part of a large discretionary grant program, rather than just focusing on, well, you guys want a transit project, so we'll give you some money if you can show that yours is better than others. No. How about, you guys want to improve your metropolitan transportation program, show us how you're going to do that in a, in a way that's innovative and different. For example, if you provide an incentive for states to, or metropolitan regions, to raise their own revenues, so if your initiative here in Atlanta that failed had been tied to more federal money, that's a different ballgame. But there's no incentive for that right now. There's, none, there's no incentive for states and locals to raise their own money for metropolitan transportation investment. It almost happened in New York, in fact. There was a program under the Bush administration where they were giving out money to regions that said, OK, we're going to do pricing. We're going to price our highways. If you did pricing the highways, they would give you some extra money for bus transit. And New York came very close to congestion pricing in the metropolitan region because of that program. So a little bit of federal money can go a long way towards overcoming local political obstacles. But unfortunately, this did, when you get rid of discretionary grant programs, you take away the federal, federal government's power to do that. And that's probably the most important power they have in transportation. And then finally, the last one, and this is where we talk about general fund revenues, the final story of my son. Max and I were watching the Packers Lions game, and you know, asking him questions. They said, Max, what uh, what do the Lions have on their helmet? He said, Oh, that's uh, that's a lion. Said, that's very good. He said, What do the Packers have on their helmet? Max said, Suitcase? <laughs> I thought that was a great answer. Because a suitcase actually makes more sense. I mean, yeah, a G makes sense for Green Bay, but who's ever heard of Green Bay? And certainly, who's ever heard of meatpacking industry in Green Bay, you know, when, in 2012? So, suitcase makes a lot more sense, even though it's wrong. And I think that the point is that Sometimes, if you think about things in a completely different way, and you kind of accept what's coming and realize that it's not necessarily a bad thing, you can do yourself a service. The solution to funding may be more obvious than we think. The, the reason that no one wants to use general fund revenues to fund transportation is that people who are benefiting from the existing system are the existing stakeholders, and they are terrified of letting go of that existing system. And that existing system has served them well for a long time. They had a lot of money. The gas tax kept being increased, or you had EMT going up, and they had plenty of money to play with. They were very happy. A lot of people got nice second homes with all that money. But actually, if you look at how the rest of the world funds their transportation system, nobody has the structure. Nobody else dedicates gas taxes to a trust fund that they then use to fund their nation's transportation system. It doesn't happen. They have much higher gas taxes than we do. But they don't use that money for transportation. The two things are not linked. 
And as a result, they're able to use the money that they have for transportation based on where the best investments would be. They're not fighting over who got how much money because the money is all coming from the general treasury. It's not coming from individual states being tracked by gas taxes. They're not fighting over who, which mode gets how much because they're not, they don't have this whole user pay argument. Anytime you try to take gas tax money and use it on transit, the highway guys, the truckers will scream bloody murder because you're taking our money and you're putting it into transit. Well, you don't have that problem with general revenues because general revenues are coming from income taxes and other, other funds. No one's sitting there saying, oh, it's a user fee, I get it back. So the move to general funds, while it's terrifying to the existing stakeholders, is not such a bad thing. We're already doing it. We may have no other choice but to do it anyway. And it's how the rest of the world does things. Now, the trade-off is that there are two big objections that are raised that are somewhat legitimate. One, contract authority. For those who don't know what contract authority is, it is that what, what these long-term authorization bills do is they say, we're going to give you money into the future so you can make long-term planning decisions for your transportation. Right. Makes a lot of sense. You don't want to have year-to-year -year appropriations for transportation because they're long-term investments. They, take, they need multi-year funding. But now, we have a two-year bill, not a six-year bill. Congress couldn't come up with enough money for a six-year bill. That's why we have a two-year bill. So contract authority isn't as relevant. And secondly, you don't need to have contract authority from a trust fund structure. You could have some other version of it through the general fund. Somehow, all these other countries manage to fund long-term transportation projects without, uh, without a highway trust fund st structure. And secondly is the idea that it's dedicated. Everybody in transportation who is used to getting this money is terrified that what this means is if it comes from general fund revenues, we're going to be competing with all the other domestic priorities. And we all know that transportation gets killed when it competes with other domestic priorities. We're not coming in ahead of defense. We're not coming in ahead of health care. No one cares about transportation at the federal level. That's why we can't raise the gas tax in the first place. If you ask people what their number one issue is in, at the local or state level with respect to their, their election, traffic congestion might show up. No one is thinking about that except maybe a few people in this room or some of the other wonks in Washington. No one is thinking about that with respect to the presidential election. And very few people are thinking about that with respect to their member of Congress or the Senate. No one's voting on the basis of national transportation policy, much less whether they think they're going to get more money for their state. So this idea that the dedicated structure is really working for us, I'm not so sure I buy it. Because the dedicated structure has meant that, we're, that our existence, our ability to fund transportation adequately in this country is dependent on our ability to raise the gas tax. Well, how well has that worked out? The way that the gas tax has worked is that everybody is terrified to touch it. Obama came in and said immediately to Jim Overstar, the chair of the, of the Transportation Committee in the House, and he said, here's my plan, $450 billion bill. We're going to move ahead with this huge reform in transportation policy. And he said to Jim, no, we're not doing that because I'm not raising the gas tax. Give me two years. I refuse to raise the gas tax during a recession. That was his decision. He decided to focus on health care, decided to focus on climate change, to focus on other things and not transportation. He wasn't spending his political capital on raising the gas tax. And Republicans are even more terrified because we've got Grover Norquist telling them that if they raise taxes on anything, that they're going to get excommunicated. So there's no possibility of raising the gas tax, and that is killing the program because we keep clinging to this possibility that maybe next time, maybe next year, we'll get a gas tax increase, and then we'll all have so much money and it'll be great. But it's not, it's really not going to happen. I mean, there are some, now the talk in Washington is, well, there's going to be a debt deal, as maybe some of you may have heard of sequestration, and there's going to be a big deal about the debt, and maybe we can slip a gas tax increase in there, because Bowles Simpson Commission recommended a gas tax increase as part of their deficit reduction plan, so maybe we can do that. Well, maybe you can, but you know what? It's still not going to fix the problem, because we want to have more fuel-efficient cars, and more people are going to continue to ride for more public transit, more people are going to be shifting away from cars. We can't depend on that as a source of revenue anyway. We'd have to shift from that to a vehicle miles travel fee or some other kind of system, and no one has the political energy to try to do something like that. Ray LaHood, Secretary of Transportation, mentioned that the USDOT was thinking about looking into the idea of a vehicle miles travel fee. And the White House Press Secretary immediately said that same day, this is not and will not be the policy of the Obama administration. So they are terrified of that. They're terrified of VMT. They're terrified of gas taxes. They don't seem to be terrified of general funds because they keep doing it. 
This $20 billion that they just put in was the third general fund bailout, plus there was a ton of general fund money used in the stimulus bill for transportation. It's the way the rest of the world does it. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. So, as you go out into the world and all of you start working for transportation agencies, and they all tell you that, no, we have to have a gas tax, we have to have user pay, and we have to have this trust fund, otherwise everyone's going to take away all our money. Think about it for a second. See if they really know what that means and what the actual impact of those trust fund structures are. Maybe, maybe you can change their mind. I'm working on it. We'll have some research coming out about this over the next year. And thank you so much for having me here today. It was really a lot of fun. I'm happy to take questions. Instead of allowing states to set targets, as we do under Map 21, what the federal government should be doing is comparing states and measuring how states are making progress. So in other words, you know, you've just reduced fatalities and injuries by X. Other states reduce fatalities and injuries by Y. Well, if X is greater than Y, then you're going to get a little more money. That's one way to do it. I'm not saying that's the only way. The point is that the federal government should be setting the measures, and they should evaluate modern and monitor progress. You can't leave it to the states to do it themselves. see 
uh, cutting spending to align with revenues. That's what would make sense with respect to the Republican platform. But in reality, when a member of Congress comes home to his district and says, hey, I just cut your transportation funding 30%, re-elect me, doesn't tend to work that well. So uh, even though it might be the fiscally responsible thing to do, it, it's going to be, it's going to face huge challenges no matter who this president is if, if they try to go that way. Yes? So there's been a conversation about the idea of national infrastructure today. Um, and you know, not, it won't be a solution, but do you think it's something that can actually make an impact? And if so, what do you think, how, what do you think it looks like? How, how public, how private? So there are two different conceptions of what a national infrastructure bank could be, not surprisingly, depending on whether you're in Congress or whether you're the president. The president wants a national infrastructure bank, which means, yeah, we give out loans, but we also give out grant money. Congress wants a national infrastructure bank that is just, we give out loans. Because Congress doesn't want the president having any authority over grant money, and they know that they can't run the infrastructure bank, so the president will have it. So that's why there hasn't been an infrastructure bank. Now, TIPIA, to describe earlier, operates very similar to an infrastructure bank. It's the same kind of concept of giving out loans. And it has been relatively successful, and it's going to be expanded, and that's a good thing, and it has real potential. But um, the problem with an infrastructure bank is the same problem with the discretionary grant program. The rural states hate it. Rural states hate it because you're going to be funding the investments that have the best return on investment. <laughs> and those typically are not in places where no one lives. So, <laughs> the, uh, they have, for example, you can have a great uh, return on investment for a national infrastructure bank for a toll road that a lot of people are driving around to get to work every day. How many of those are in Montana? Not that many. And the chair of the finance committee just happens to be the senator from Montana. He also be, happens to be the chair of the subcommittee on highways and the environment public works committee. So he is not going to let that happen. Now that these things change, and you know they're, they're fluid, but the, that he's been the primary obstacle to a national infrastructure bank. And most people who care about whether there's loan money available at discount rates feel like that's already been accomplished through TIFIA. So and that was a big priority of this administration. It got slammed at every turn, and it's probably probably good. Yes. Understanding issues take um, the Right, so it's a tension because um, on the one hand, as I started with, I think that the process should be more bottom up. States and the metropolitan regions should be making the decisions about how they spend the money, and the federal government should only be evaluating the outcomes, not how they spend the money, which is a lot of what they do now. Right now, it's very top down. It's very much this money must be spent on X purpose, this money must be spent on X purpose, which is not really relevant. But you have to ask yourself, why do we have a federal program at all? We have a federal program in theory, hopefully, because there are certain goals we want to accomplish through transportation investment that would not be accomplished if, we, if the states just did it on their own. And in fact, we just released a report, and I encourage you to check it out, called The Consequences of Underinvesting in Transportation. And what this report says is, let's say we cut, we cut revenues, or we cut spending to align with revenues. We made that 30% cut and we spend only what we're taking in, in gas taxes, how would states react? And the answer is that states would probably be able to replace somewhere around 60% of that money. And the transit authorities would be able to replace very little of that money. And there would be severe cuts to public transportation, and there would be probably some serious deterioration of the highway network. So that's the argument that is often was made by uh, strong conservatives, libertarian types of, well, let's just evolve the program. Let the states handle it. They, they can do it. Why do we need to have the federal government here at all? That's a perfectly legitimate point of view. It just happens to be the case that if you do that, there will be some serious consequences at the moment. You could argue for why that's a good policy. But the alternative, the flip side is, well, OK, so we need a federal program. So why? what are we trying to accomplish with this federal program? And if you just say, well, we need a federal program, but you just give the money to the states and let them do what they want with it, then you may as well not have a federal program. All you're doing is the federal government's acting as a, as a political as the political will of the states. Well, the states won't raise their gas tax. Well, we have some gas tax money, so you can have this. <laughs> that's, that's not helpful. So if it's federal money, there should be a return on investment with respect to national goals. There are certain goals that the federal government should be in charge of. I would argue reducing our dependence on oil, reducing uh, emissions, uh, improving safety across the network, improving connectivity across the network, and frankly, improving transportation in metropolitan regions. Because that's where the economics of a country, that's where, where, it's where all the money's generated. 
That's, that's how we are able to be the, uh, so, such a powerful economy, it's because of cities, because of metropolitan regions. So I think there's a federal role in helping all of those things. And if you just give the money to states without any performance measures, you know, through these formula programs, you're not accomplishing those things. And so those states Sorry? Tipping, yeah. Yeah, do we have national goal measures? So they actually, it's funny you should ask that. There actually were performance measures associated with TIPIA uh, that this administration put in that they said we're going to give out. It's not going to be just about whether the federal government is likely to get its money back in this loan. It's also going to be about oh, what are we accomplishing? What are the performance measures? And uh, Jim Inhofe did not like that and they stripped that out, and there are now no performance measures other than, is this a good return on investment? So, no. Yes? Well, of course there are differences among states, and I think that's why the bottom-up approach is what you need to have um, for these circumstances. I mean, the, the problem with states setting their own targets is that they, if, the, if the targets are tied to any kind of funding, they're going to be very careful about how they set those targets, right? They're going to make sure that they set them in a way that, and right now they're not even tied to funding, but if they were tied to funding, um, they, would, they would be completely biased in how they set those targets. I think you can account for the differences between states by saying, look, we're all trying to accomplish these national goals. We're all trying to make progress towards these national goals. And whereas one state may do better on one or two goals, another state may do better on another one. Just to give an example, I keep bringing up Montana. It's my favorite rural punching bag. <laughs> Montana happens, because it's a rural state, has a higher, sh very high share of fatalities and injuries per capita. Um, more accidents happen on, on rural roads. They do not have a metropolitan congestion problem. If you look at the performance measures as a spectrum, as a uh, set, and not individually, so in other words, not just saying, well, you guys did great metropolitan, so here's more money, you guys did great in safety, here's more money. If you look at them as a whole, in a holistic manner, then, then Montana can compete with New York, because Montana will do, be able to do better in the safety measures, and maybe in the national connectivity measures, and New York might be able to do better in the metropolitan measures. So you can structure it in a way that's fair, uh, when you're having states compete with one another. I think that the states setting their own individual targets thing is just bound to set you up for meaningless performance measures. Yes? I, I found your comments about states setting performance measures really interesting because it's been my experience that if there's one level of government that runs faster away from conflict than anyone, it's the federal government. So if, if there needs to be an enforcement mechanism, what do you see as the, as the incentive for there to be a real, really fair enforcement of those, of those rules? That's a really good point. I think it's, um, the federal government does not want to enforce uh, those rules, and it's very reluctant to enforce them. But I also think that there is a pretty strong distrust uh, of the moment of the ability of government across the board, particularly the federal government, to deliver um, on anything. And you don't fix that by saying, well, you know, we're going to eliminate government. I mean, that's one way to fix it, is to cut the way to go, how much government there is. And that's Grover Norquist's way of fixing it. And there, there's legitimacy to that. I would argue that if you do that, you're going to miss out on a lot of these important national goals. So if you're not going to get rid of the role, then you have to make them accountable. You have to put in accountability. And accountability means accountability across the board. So it means that if, if you're going to hold the federal government accountable, then you're going to have to hold the states accountable, because the states are the ones who are implementing this. So you know, it's again, it's a, it's a question of uh, what's the least bad option. The, the, the two options are we can continue to give money to states with no accountability or with the limited 
introduction to accountability that's in 9.1, or we can try to introduce accountability to the system. I would argue that we're better off going towards trying to introduce accountability, recognizing that it's not going to be easy, recognizing the federal government is going to be terrified of doing it. But I think if we slowly bring states along and move in the direction and show that it's fair, eventually people will buy into it. Thank you. Yes. Maybe we can change the language. Instead of calling it a bonus measure, why don't we go for standards? The interstate system is a set of design standards which all states comply with. And they have to do it so they can do that to get those matching points. So is there some way in which we can set some minimum standard which all states must meet? Now, you know, how do you do it? Is, is how you must have and we all make the same standard? That's a technical issue, which a lot of folks in this room can help with. Is there some way to do it? Well, I guess the only reason I would you know, say I prefer the word performance measures to standards, is that we're talking a large part of it economics here, right? It's not really engineering. It's, it's economics. It's return on investment from an economic perspective. And if, you know, for safety, you could have a standard, right? For emissions, you could have a standard. For petroleum consumption, you could have a standard. That I get. But when it comes to economic measures, which are really hard, I think you need to have something that is uh, showing to make more progress because everybody wants their shiny new highway or new transit project in their metropolitan area. So how do we choose? Who gets it? Who doesn't get it? It's got to be on some economic basis. I just don't know how you do a standard for that. Connectivity, you can have standards. Yes, connectivity, accessibility, you can do, you can do on that basis. Yeah. Yes? Uh, touching on, I guess, kind of a sentiment that we've heard Um, my question is, more and more states and counties, so the local level is really focusing on trying to generate more revenue, so they're going to sales tax measures quite a bit. Um, wondering if you see that as a continuing trend as federal funding shrinks, and then also kind of wondering if your, your argument of putting more money to the general funds, um, a big, I guess, people argument of why people are usually voting in favor of sales tax is because there's an identifiable list of projects that they can see, and they feel like they know what they're getting, and they know their money's not going to something else that could be in the general fund and being taken away. So how do you kind of justify that to them? Right. Again, again, that's why that's why transportation gets support at the local, state and local level, because you can give them a list of projects. And I don't think it's so much the funding source as it is the list of projects. I mean, there are places where they've increased gas taxes at the state level because they were given a list of projects. Um, so it's not so much about the funding source, but I think you raise an important question about sales taxes. Because I, my personal view, and I'm not at the state level, and I don't typically operate at the state level. My personal view is I don't like sales tax dedicated to, sales tax dedicated to transportation. And I'll tell you why. Because I don't like gas taxes dedicated to transportation. I made that pretty clear because of the reasons that I articulated. But sales taxes um, are even worse because there's not only are you saying, here's money that's dedicated to transportation, and therefore everyone knows who paid what and who gets what. But you're doing it in a regressive way, right? I mean, sales taxes are more regressive than gas taxes. And there's some research out there that I've seen that I really liked that uh, pointed to some of these equity issues and said, no, if you really want to do it right, there's some evidence that pricing based on vehicle miles traveled or using tolls may actually be a more progressive way of collecting revenues, depending on how you use those revenues, of course, because it's always about how you use the revenues. I mean, if you collected a sales tax and use it only on public transportation, it's probably not that regressive. But if you collect a sales tax and put it all on the highways, it is regressive. So it depends in large part on what you spend it on. But I would just say that I think that um, the, from our perspective, and my perspective in DC, we are so desperate for states and locals to be able to raise their own revenues that I don't really even care. I mean, I can't even get into that. You know, it's more like the federal government's role is should be to incentivize states to raise money, sales taxes, tolls, gas tax, whatever you can do, because the federal money is going away. Yes. Um, so for a long time, it was easy to justify uh, auto auto based um, expenditures because we have an interstate system, and you can make a pretty good argument that it's a national concern. We need to have an interstate defense network or whatever. But it's finished. Um, and they had a nice ribbon cutting a couple of years back. That was great. Um, but transit, and I'm a huge transit advocate, I still find myself 
challenge to actually make a good argument as to why there's ever a federal role in transit unless the city spans two states. I'm still like, fundamentally, why, if it's just for loans, that's fine, the actual money going to a transit program in a city, I still find it hard to articulate why that should be a federal role. Mm -hmm. I noticed you, you mentioned, you know, that's where economics happen, and that's great, but, uh, you know, do you have any sort of response to that, and what the sort of good comeback is for, for Yeah, you? well, I feel pretty strongly about this. I mean, coming from New York, which obviously is a unique case, but, you know, which is a better return on your federal investment? Um, you know, the second avenue subway in New York, uh, or uh, a new highway uh, to wide open development in Arizona. You know, I would argue the second avenue subway in New York is a way better return on the federal investment. You gotta remember, the, the key argument to make when people say that is, the interstate system was not supposed to go into urban areas. <laughs> the interstate system was not supposed to carry traffic for suburbanites uh, to go commute between suburbs. It, Eisenhower was shocked to find out that the interstate system wound up going into the urban area. He never intended it to be. It was supposed to connect places, because that's why it was national. But the primary use of the interstate system is for commuting. That's what it's most used for. So to say, if, if commuting on the interstate is a, is a federal purpose, then why would commuting by transit not be a federal purpose? You know, and in some places, I would, I would argue, there's not much of a role for transit, and it shouldn't be the federal government's job to say that there has to be a role for transit. Again, that's why I think there needs to be a bottom-up approach. If you say to a city or a metropolitan region, look, we don't care how you do it, but we want to see you lower emissions, we want to see you reduce petroleum consumption, we want to see greater accessibility, we want to see lower safety, better safety. <laughs> how are they going to accomplish that? Transit could be a way, but transit's not the only way. A city could say, you know what, we're an outdoor city, we're going to do this through uh, greater bike paths and pedestrian areas, and we're going, to, we're going to be the first city in the country that has all electric vehicle fleets, uh, and we're going to provide incentives for our citizens to do that. There are other ways. It doesn't have to be through transit. But the fact is that in most of the older uh, metropolitan regions, and most of the Northeast, and a lot of the Midwest, transit is going to be the primary way that you accomplish those national goals. So if you think that those are important national goals, that transit should be should be used. How many highways, new highways, are you building through the old urban areas? You're not going to do it. I know that you know some urban areas you can still build highways. Well, that's not true in D.C., New York, San Francisco, even Los Angeles. They're not building any more highways. So if you want to improve the accessibility of the region, you're going to have to build transit. So either you think that transit is a if you either think that accessibility for metropolitan regions is an important federal goal, or it's not. If you don't think it's an important federal goal, then you need to cut funding for the interstate system, because the interstate system is providing the vast majority of that accessibility. You already asked me.
Why don't we take uh, one more question because we're starting to wind down. Sure. Yes. Um, so you mentioned that we're kind of the most having trust funds on our country. <laughs> and everything else, too. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the world. So clearly other countries, I'm assuming, have heard there's a world uh, conflicts. Yes. Um, and we're not the only ones. So they've been able to go and, and compete against the defense and the health care and the education at the national level. So why is there a failure here? It seems like there's a disconnect. You know, you're talking about from the bottom up. If most people live in metro areas, and these are issues that are concerns for them, maybe as a society at the federal level, and then the state there doesn't see the value of it as much as it should. And maybe, I mean, what, what's, what's the fear, I guess, in the community? I don't think it's so much fear. I think it's the way that our government is set up. And we have two senators from each state, and the state boundaries are not really based on anything relevant to the 21st century, right? <laughs> They're antiquated. They have no meaning in any serious manner. I mean, you've got some metropolitan areas that span across three or four states. You've got other states that have very few metropolitan areas at all, um, and they have two representatives in Congress. I mean, D.C. has 600,000 people. We have zero representatives in Congress. <laughs> Wyoming and Montana have fewer, and they have two senators each. So most countries don't deal with that problem. They may have the rural urban fight, but they don't have um, the tremendous overrepresentation of rural areas that we do. Uh, not just in the Senate, by the way, but the Electoral College, too. You know, I don't know if you may be aware that the Electoral College, you know, just because a, set, uh, a state has one representative doesn't mean that it has enough people to justify one representative. And so, you know, Montana has three votes. Again, just love picking on them. <laughs> Montana has three votes in the Electoral College, but uh, their one representative is, you know, for, for 500,000 people. And meanwhile, in California, you have know, representatives representing a lot more than that. So it's, um, it's incredibly uh, balanced and tilted towards uh, rural areas, which in some ways is what the founders intended, right? They were somewhat hostile to, to uh, urban uh, interests. So it's, I think that's the main difference is our structure of government. We don't have a parliamentary democracy. We have uh, a republic, and it is a uh, confusing and wonderful and ridiculous system all at the same time. Um, but, you know, I, I leave you on a high note. I, I, I have seen the, the best and the worst of Washington. And one thing that I've seen that I don't think other countries do is I've seen the chair of the Transportation Committee, which John Lincoln this year, sit there for probably 18 straight hours working on this transportation bill in a public forum a public setting, allowing people to comment, allowing people to give the suggestion. He wasn't even online, basically saying, call me, you have a suggestion for the transportation bill. It was an incredible display of open democracy. So there are a lot of flaws in our political system. It's tilted, and existing stakeholders have too much power, and rural states have too much power, and a lot of problems. But at the bottom line is, I do have a fundamental belief at the end of the day, especially at the state and local level, but even at the federal level, representatives in our country will listen to their constituents. And if constituents are out there making enough noise, they'll do something about it. So there's one. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I just want to remind you of our professionals who are interested in talking to our chapter. Uh, please find me. I'd be more than happy to talk to you.